Hello everybody, this is Dr. Peter Dillard, and what I'd like to do in the next few videos is discuss some similarities and differences between the earlier and later philosophies of Ludwig Wittgenstein. Some of my younger colleagues have expressed interest in hearing me say a few things about this, so that's what I'd like to do, and I'm going to discuss three general areas. Uh, one is the different conceptions of logic that one finds in Frege and Russell on the one hand and the early Wittgenstein on the other. Another issue is the picture theory of meaning. I want to say a little bit about that in another video. And then finally, I'd like to come to Wittgenstein's discussion of rule following in the investigations and say some things about his later philosophy. So all of this is kind of square one stuff that you really need to understand if you want to engage Wittgenstein's thought at any sophisticated level. So uh, I'm not going to get into his biography. There's a very excellent one by Ray Monk called The Duty of Genius that you can consult. Uh, I want to just dive right in and start talking about his ideas. So today I want to talk about Wittgenstein's conception of logic in the Tractatus. Uh, this may spill over into another video, but let me see how it goes. Uh, so I want to talk about the general difference between Wittgenstein on the one hand and Frege and Russell on the other vis-a-vis -vis logic. I want to say something about Wittgenstein's notion of a logically perspicuous proposition. And finally, I want to address his idea of the general form of proposition. I may also say something about his views of mathematics. I might put that in another video, in arithmetic in particular. So let's talk about, let's just get right to it. So what is the difference between the way Frege and Russell think about logic and the way the early Wittgenstein does? Well, for Frege and Russell, like here's a logical law. For all x, uh, x is f or x is not f. Here's another one. There is no y such that uh, y is both g and not g. These are logical generalizations. And they may be formulated in Frege's Begriffsschrift or in the language of Principia Mathematica that Russell set forth in the early 20th century. So they're logical generalizations. And for Frege and Russell, they're like generalizations such as, well, all ravens are black empirical generalizations, except they're more general than that. Logic is the maximally general science, but it's like science in that it it's, it's consists, at least here, of generalizations. Uh, much of it does. So, so that's the way they think of it. Uh, additionally, Frege and Russell think that logic, though, is necessary, right? that it has a certain kind of ne necessary status. It's necessarily true or logical falsehood is necessarily false. So it doesn't really matter how the world is. Now here, Wittgenstein sees a tension because he agrees with them that logic is necessary. Logical truths like the ones that I just showed you, they have a logical, a, a necessary status. They're necessarily true, right? Um, but if, if they're like generalizations though, if in other words, they're like all ravens are black, this empirical generalization, it's just that they're a little more, they're much more general than that. Well, then it's very mysterious why they're necessary, because obviously all ravens are black is not a necessary truth, it's contingent. We could imagine there being white ravens, whereas we can't imagine the negations of these logical truths. So Wittgenstein is very dissatisfied with that, and he comes up with a radically different conception of logic in the Tractatus, which is that logic is not a maximally general science. Logic is not a science at all. Logic is zinlos, it's about nothing. It doesn't say anything about the world. It's completely empty. And it's this emptiness that allows logical truths to be necessarily true and logical falsehoods to be necessarily false. How? Well, here's where Wittgenstein's notion of a logically perspicuous proposition comes into play. For Wittgenstein, this, the st sentences or propositions of ordinary language are, are perfectly all right as they are, except for one thing. They do not perspicuously display their logical structure, but hide it. So what Wittgenstein does is devise a way of rewriting the propositions of ordinary language that perspicuously displays their underlying logical structure. They wear their logical structure on their sleeves, so to speak, that, so that we can see it. And this is the so-called method of truth tables that Wittgenstein elaborates in the Tractatus. So how does that have anything to do with logical truth? Well, take this one. Here, here's a logical truth. If P, then Q, and not Q, then not P. That's a logical truth. It can't be false. How is that? Well, Wittgenstein 
with the notion of a perspicuous propos logically perspicuous proposition gives us a way of rewriting propositions, complex ones, so we break them down into their parts and which are put together with the truth functional connectives of like or and 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 if then and not. And so these complex propositions have constituent propositions and we assign truth values to the constituents and then calculate the truth value of the whole based on the truth values of its parts. So here you can see what I've done is con I've constructed a very uh, simple truth table here. So P and Q receive truth values, and then here's the last line under the main connective, which is of the entire proposition. And notice that it always comes out true. So no matter what truth values we assign to the uh, parts of the proposition, the constituent propositions of the whole, the whole proposition comes out true, and we can see that immediately. Now for Wittgenstein, this is a logical truth, which is obviously necessarily true because it doesn't matter how the world is, it always comes out true. And this truth table itself, in particular its last line, is another way of writing the original proposition, uh, if P then Q and not Q then P, we could rewrite that in terms of T's and F's and see immediately that it has to be a logical truth. This is a perspicuous propositional sign for the same proposition. Um, this is a, pers a perspicuous, logically perspicuous proposition because it wears its logical structure on its sleeve. And the same is true for logical falses, except their last lines always come out false. So this is a very interesting idea that Wittgenstein has. Now, what is the general form of all propositions? Well, to be brief here, Wittgenstein, again, is thinking about truth functional logic. And we could say that, let's say, a pair of truth functional connectives like and and negation. Those are functionally adequate. If any truth functional proposition, whether it contains if and then or 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 not or whatever, could be rewritten using only and and not. In other words, those two connectives are functionally adequate uh, to be used to rewrite any complex proposition of truth functional logic. We could always replace a truth functional proposition containing any of those other connectives cont with one that contains only the connectives and and not. And there are other examples of functionally adequate connectives too. But the one that interests uh, Wittgenstein in particular is one that Scheffer, an American logician, investigates, and that's called the Scheffer stroke or NAND. And NAND is a unary, single truth functional connective. What's interesting about it is that every proposition, every truth functional proposition, can be rewritten using only the than symbol, only the NAND connective, without any of the other things like if, then, or and, or not. And a NAND is functionally adequate. And we can show that briefly by showing that, well, we know that, NAND, we know that negation and, let's say, conjunction are functionally adequate. So if we can show that negation can be expressed solely in terms of NAND, and conjunction can too, then we know that NAND is functionally adequate, and we can. Here it is. Um, not P is P, NAND P. And NAND means something like joint negation. It means not, to put it in terms of disjunction, not P or P, which is equivalent to not P. All right? It's the joint negation of all the propositions, or not P and not P. It's the joint negation of all the propositions to which it's applied. And similarly, P and Q is equivalent to P nan P nan Q nan Q. You make it a little bit more complex. So you see that any, since we know that these negation and uh, conjunction are functionally adequate, and they can be expressed using only nan, we know that it is too. And this, Wittgenstein says, is the general form of any logical proposition. It's, in other words, any truth functional proposition whatsoever can be elegantly expressed using only a single truth functional connective like nan. And that's the general form of proposition that he talks about. Now, let me say a little bit about uh, Wittgenstein's, some problems with Wittgenstein's view of logic. And if I have time, I'll say something about his views of mathematics. So notice that all of the logic that we've been discussing here, and, when, and Wittgenstein's paradigmatic example of logic is truth functional logic. But there are other things besides that. For example, the generalizations that I started out with. These are general statements that involve quantifiers. Now the problem for Wittgenstein's view is that if, you know, it's not, 
at all clear how general propositions can be expressed merely as truth functional compounds. And to put this briefly, if I were to say something like, you know, well, for, for all x, x is red, right? Everything is red. How would I express that in terms, in purely truth functional terms? Well, I might try to make an infinite conjunction. I might say, well, that means that x is red, y is red, z is red, and, and, and. The problem is that that conjunction is only going to capture the generalization if I go through all, every possible conjunct or every possible object is red. But see, now I'm using all, the word all again. I've fallen back onto the very notion that I'm trying to explicate, which is the universal quantifier, so that I really haven't done that. Or if I say that, well, something is pink. There is an x such that x is pink. That might be understood as an infinite disjunction. Well, that means that a is pink, or B is pink, or C is pink, or something is. But the problem is the same, which is that I have to go through all of, you know, I have to go through every single thing. It has to be the case that I've gone through every single possible disjunct, so that there is no disjunct that I have left out. But then, now I'm using the existential quantifier with negation, which is what I'm trying to explain. So it, it's, and this is a criticism that Russell made of Wittgenstein in his, uh, I believe in the introduction to the tractate, at least to one edition of it. So that, that's a problem for Wittgenstein. What are some other problems with Wittgenstein's view uh, of logic? And this is getting a little bit into what I want to talk about next time, but that's okay, let's just, let's just touch base there. There seem to be propositions like, well, something can't be simultaneously red all over and blue all over that, that are necessary. I can't even imagine that that would be false. It seems like it has to be true. But it's notoriously difficult, if not impossible, to reduce that kind of statement about colors to merely a, you know, a truth functional compound. It, it, it's very, very difficult, if not impossible, to do that. And Wittgenstein wrestled with this. It was one of the things that led him to abandon his views in the Tractatus. And that didn't immediately lead him to the later philosophy, but he sort of loosened up his thinking because he knew that these things um, did not really make sense. If I'm not mistaken, I think Frank Ramsey pressed this issue against Wittgenstein, and Wittgenstein never really came up with a satisfactory answer to it. So these are some of the things about Wittgenstein's view of logic that, that give rise, pause, give us pause and that give rise to questions. Now, one last thing I want to do, which I think is very interesting, is, well, what about mathematics? You know, one plus one is equal to two, um, or two plus three is equal to five. Um, we want to say that these are necessary truths, and, but how do we do that? I mean, we don't, they aren't really two functional statements, and it doesn't look like they're two functional, uh, two functional propositions. So what do we say about them? Now, Wittgenstein thinks that the statements of mathematics are also zinlos. They're empty, and they're necessary. How does he do that? Well, very briefly, he thinks that numbers, there aren't any such things as numbers or objects. Numbers are simply a kind of indexing method. They are, what he wants to say, they are the indices of an operation. So what does he mean by an operation? Well, like suppose like an operation would be like my putting apples into a basket. So I could put one apple or two apple or three apple. So we could call this operation omega. So what does two plus three equal five be, me, mean? Well, it means, well, something like this. Well, I, I apply the operation twice, and then I apply it three more times, and then I wind up with five things in the basket, right? So here's what Wittgenstein does there. So here's 2 plus 3 equals 5. And we can write that initially as here's the operation with 2 indexed to it. Here is the operation with 3. And then here's the, um, here is the result 5, the operation with 5 indexed to it. Then when we unpack that, on this side we get 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 equals. And then on this side, when we unpack that, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And that's a tautology. It's like saying A equals A. Here it's five omegas equal five omegas. You can see that. Now here's a very interesting idea that Wittgenstein develops independently of truth tables to show how numbers can be eliminated merely as, as they, they can be construed as indices of an operation or various operations and then eliminated. There's no such thing as numbers. They're just these strings of signs that are tautologies. That's what arithmetic, that's what primitive recursive arithmetic is. Now, in conclusion, 
A difficulty with Wittgenstein's view of mathematics is that, as I just implied, it seems to work fairly well for arithmetic, you know, addition and uh, subtraction uh, and multiplication and division, which we could construe in, in those terms. But it doesn't, there are higher parts of mathematics. What about calculus? What about algebraic equations? What about that? Uh, those are the things that we need in order to do science. And it's by no means clear that we can re reduce those kinds of truths, which presumably Wittgenstein would want to say are necessary truths. It's by no means at all clear, in fact, it's very unlikely, that we can reduce them to true functional compounds that always come out true, regardless of the, mean, the truth values of their parts, or that we could somehow construe them as operations or the re repetitions of operations that simply yield tautologous strings like the one that I just talked about. So that's what I want to say about this today. Next time I'm going to turn attention to the picture theory, and then later we'll come back to Wittgenstein on rules and maybe some other things that, that people might find interesting. So that's all I want to say today. Thank you for joining me. I hope that this is instructive. Like I said, this is kind of square one stuff that you really need to understand if you're going to engage Wittgenstein at any sophisticated philosophical level. Um, but I hope this helps. And so until next time, this is Dr. Peter Dillard. I wish everybody a happy 2000, uh, and 20, 2021, and let's hope things get better soon, sooner rather than later. Uh, until next time, take care of yourselves. Thanks for joining me.